All right. Uh, well, it's just me. <laughs> no one has joined um, uh, for this toot. Um, but this is uh, Laws 12066, uh, Land Law. And uh, we're doing topic 10 on freehold uh, covenants. Uh, look, I know it's a busy time. People are finalising uh, assessments um, and final written assessments and so on and so forth. So, you know, that's understandable. Um, but I'm doing a recording and it will be uploaded to the Moodle website uh, on this important topic. Uh, and uh, just also say at uh, the beginning of the um, of the tute or of the presentation that uh, I'm offering a second class this evening. Um, sent an email out about this 8:30 p.m. this evening. I'm sorry, it's a bit late um, for about an hour on social housing and uh, last topic, topic 11. And I'll just say a few things at the end about the final written assessment as well. Um, so stay tuned for that, and that recording will also, or that um, tute will also be recorded and uploaded to the Moodle website um, for the benefit of all. Look, this topic on freehold covenants, um, it's a little bit tricky, I think is fair to say, uh, and how in, we understand covenants as basically being about the way in which uh, parties can, through private agreement, um, impact upon land use, comes out of um, a historical background where there was no intervention by the state, as by the political state, by the government of the day, through legislation, uh, through the parliament, uh, as we have in the modern period, in the 20th century, in the 21st century, as ARP will note, uh, in uh, Chapter 18. Um, which is very much about uh, land use planning today and there's quite specific laws uh, around that, legislation around that. But the private agreements through covenant that can be entered into um, between uh, parties, private parties, uh, although it comes out of that historical um, desire to um, place restrictions on how land could be used in various ways um, where there wasn't government intervention. It continues today into the modern period. And so what we have to appreciate today is that we can, the, these uh, uh, aims and ends of land use planning can be achieved by private agreement and there is the impact of legislation uh, in, in achieving this. The other uh, point to note just I think at the outset is that um, particularly given that um, in Queensland of course uh, all lots are subject to the LTA and uh, thus Torrens lots and subject to the framework of the Torrens uh, statute. Not all covenants, freehold covenants um, can in fact uh, be registered under the LTA uh, and um, essentially um, under Chapter 6, Part 4A and Division 8A of the L, uh, uh, sorry, um, Division 4, Capital A of the Land Title Act, um, only covenants in favour of the state or uh, an entity representing the state or local government um, under specific legislation can actually be registered uh, under Division 6 of uh, the LTA. And uh, you can, for a good discussion of that, I direct you to uh, the Land uh, Title Practice Manual, uh, Part 31 on Covenants. Um, remember, as I indicate in the beginning of the notes, that, um, of course, the legislation, such as it does, govern covenants, um, of course, not just in the LTA, and, of course, that only deals with those types of covenants that are subject to the LTA, which essentially is covenants involving, um, you know, the government as this political state agency of the government and so on. Um, there is also, as you will have seen, the key provisions uh, within uh, the um, Property Law Act, PLA, and in particular, um, Part 6, which uh, deals in, in, um, in Division 1 within Part 6, which deals with deeds and covenants. Um, and also there's a couple of other provisions in the PLA as well. 
Now, something that's pointed out at the outset of um, ARPL in Chapter 18, and I think is uh, prudent to, to just um, bring forward, uh, not only today have we got this um, impact of legislation with regard to land use planning, and we need to be aware of that, um, but we still can um, effect um, restrictions in terms of land use through private agreement, um, through the mechanism of the covenant. Uh, but this idea of covenant we've seen already, it's come up uh, earlier in the course, and uh, in particular we saw it in relation to the topic on leases, and we saw that a lease has covenants within it, and we've also seen that there's issues around um, the, the protection that's afforded to those covenants in the lease. And uh, we've also seen that, that uh, of course, all lots in Queensland, as we, as we know, it's common, common ground between us that um, um, all lots are Torrens land, Torrens lots. And so, therefore, leases under the LTA uh, can be registered. And, of course, the covenants in those leases a part of that, uh, and the, the natural consequence of that is um, the extent to which those covenants also attract the indefeasibility under the LTA. Now, we need to distinguish between lease covenants or leasehold covenants, if we can explain it like that, and freehold covenants, covenants over the freehold of the land. Okay, And uh, I just want to direct you to something that ARP, ARPL says, which I think is quite useful uh, on the point and uh, if you just uh, have a look at for example page 882 uh, paragraph 18.15 uh, the point is made that there is an overlap between um, the discussion here in terms of freehold covenants and the enforcement of leasehold covenants um, and that uh, the the ideas around these covenants in both of these areas, um, there is similarities. For example, as just taken from the words there of the text writers on page 882, um, there is the requirement in both cases, that's for leasehold covenants and freehold covenants, um, that a covenant touches and concerns the land of the covenantee before the benefit will run to the assignee. Uh, and in, in this instance, the laws applicable to freehold covenants, like those applicable to leasehold covenants, derive from that early 16th century English case, Spencer's case, which we saw and was referred to in the topic on leases. Um, in most respects, as the authors continue, the laws relevant to freehold covenants have developed separately from those of leasehold covenants. So when, and, and, they, and, they, and the authors go on to indicate that these things are distinct, so we need to be, we understand that. So that even though we've seen this idea of covenant before, we need to somehow keep in our minds separate the, the thinking and, and the, the law that's evolved in terms of determining um, how we understand a leasehold covenant on the one hand from a freehold covenant on the other, which we're discussing at the moment in this context of this topic. The other point that we just need to um, emphasise at the outset, uh, and that is that... Uh, we can talk about covenants as either positive or negative covenants. Um, and um, again, if we just go back to the, the um, commentary there from in ARPL back on 881, um, the reference there just generally to Hallsbury's definition of a covenant, an agreement under seal whereby the parties or some of them are or is bound to do or not to do a specific thing, but this must be distinguished from a restrictive covenant, which is a covenant restricting the use or enjoyment of certain land for the benefit of other land and binding on every owner of the burdened land having notice of the covenant. As the authors just continue uh, at paragraph 18.05 on page 881, the reason why it is referred to as a restrictive covenant is that equity will not enforce a covenant against an assignee of the covenantor, where to do so would oblige the assignee to expend money. And uh, so it's important to understand that we can be talking about positive or negative covenants. 
up that really our focus is on restrictive covenants, which are operating to restrict the capability of the owner to, of land to be able to do various things in various ways with their land. And there might be a, a range of reasons for that. Um, if you have a look, for example, at the, um, the diagrams, well, the pictures, really, illustrations, better way to put it, the illustrations that um, I posted onto um, the Moodle website for topic 10, um, and that's really interesting because they show the development of land use, particularly uh, the, the illustrations um, go right back to the 17th century in England. Some of the very famous um, locations, particularly in London, um, where by the use of both lease, lease, leases or, or leasehold planning and also um, freehold covenants, then restrictions were placed on the use of land, which ultimately meant that um, certain areas of land were preserved for certain purposes, some parks and gardens within what essentially we would call today housing estates that emerged, but it's hard to refer to, for example, Leicester Square as a housing estate. Um, but that's essentially what it was. So um, those that were developing those sites at the time, and, you know, if you go back a couple of centuries, of course, they, they're not anything like what they are today. Um, you know, I recall, you know, having been in London just recently, a couple of years ago, and having been there several times, that, you know, these are both beautiful, very picturesque, um, highly um, dense housing areas, um, but there are preserved spaces, public spaces, public gardens, which is very interesting. Um, if, you, if you have a look at um, modern Australian cities, for example, Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, you don't find the same sort of preserved areas. I mean, yes, they all have, you know, one large, you know, um, garden, botanical gardens or Hyde Park or the equivalent thereof. But within housing that exists or has developed, there is not these areas that have been preserved. Now, freehold covenants and, and also to some extent leaseholds that were historically used serve this purpose. Today, land use planning mechanisms under legislation try to achieve that same purpose. But what's interesting is that even though we've had the intervention of the parliament, we've got legislation in place, we still don't see a lot of these preserved sanctuaries, if you like, within areas that are otherwise contained within, within housing or um, dwelling estates, if you can put it like that. Some of the illustrations um, take us into the modern period, um, and many of those are drawn from New South Wales, because uh, this draws from some materials that I used um, where I delivered a course with um, colleagues somewhere else um, a few years back. Um, and But the other thing too, of course, is that there's more historical, um, you know, early origin in, in New South Wales and Sydney, for example, um, with regard to this, and just, for instance, the Daisyville Garden suburb development. And again, you know, partly this was to these restrictions, the purpose of these restrictions was to preserve amenity, was to preserve features and characteristics of the environment. Um, and, and then the point came as to, well, but, you know, we, we just don't want this necessarily to be one off and then when the land is transferred or assigned, it, 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 it needs to be preserved on an ongoing basis. And how can that happen? And, and the law had to say, well, what, what, what are we looking at here? Um, and it's at that point it's, it's helpful and useful just again to, to go back to ARPL, again at the bottom of page 881, that makes note, this is paragraph 18.10, of the overlap between easements and restrictive covenants. And that's interesting because last week we looked at uh, restrictive covenants and restrictive covenants, uh, re sorry, easements, easements in the last topic, and easements were about recognising certain rights and responsibilities, um, most typically between adjoining landowners, um, to do certain things. That it wasn't actually an ownership claim, 
but it was a, an obligation expressed and there was this idea of benefiting and burdening um, dominant and servient land and so on in, in that topic. The author's ARPL here, just, just to quote from this um, paragraph 18.10, um, there is considerable overlap between easements and restrictive covenants. In certain circumstances, the same obligation can be imposed either as an easement or a restrictive covenant. That's interesting. Depending on the wording of the instrument. For example, a landowner who sells part of his or her land and wishes to ensure that the purchaser will not erect a building which severely restricts the access of light to a part of the land retained may either reserve to himself or herself an express easement of light. The overlap between the scope of easements and restrictive covenants is such that covenants have frequently been referred to as an extension in equity of the doctrine of negative easements. That's interesting, very interesting. Um, but, and this is an important point that the uh, ARPL then note, that uh, despite this, despite the overlap, um, easements and covenants are conceptually quite distinct. So that's quite important. I think um, we just need to bear that in mind. There are overlaps, but quite distinct. So what we're looking at in this topic is um, freehold covenants um, between uh, parties that really is about trying to achieve um, land use control through private agreement. That's essentially, um, if, we, if we put it in a nutshell, what we're looking at. And... As you can see from the topic notes, um, as I've mentioned already, there's impact of um, LTA with regard to covenants involving government or government agencies or government authorities. There's the PLA with respect to um, certain matters more generally with regard to, to um, covenants, deeds and so on. And that's a note at the beginning. Um, then really looking at the mechanics of how the law recognise, recognises and enforces a covenant, you'll see reference to the idea of transferring the benefit of a restrictive covenant. So here's the idea of benefit and also burden, which, which we saw previously in, in uh, our topic on easements. Um, and we also saw it too um, when we were looking at, of course, in covenants in, in leases, uh, but as I've already pointed out, we need to distinguish that discussion from, from what we're talking about here. But there are, there are overlaps, as you can see. So that first idea is the transferring the benefit of a restrictive covenant and what that means, um, either through process of annexation and, and the Forest View decision, uh, important in that regard, um, or through legislation. And there's reference then to the Property Law Act, Section 53, for example, um, by assignment, where the legal requirements for an assignment of a shows in action, something intangible, an intangible right, um, have not been complied with, the assignment may be validated, validated in equity. So again, this relationship between um, the, uh, the mechanisms that are able to be achieved uh, or used to achieve a certain purpose and what apparatus of law comes into play here. Um, and... This area is very much you're looking at the relationship between common law and equity, again, as has been a continuing theme through our property law studies, but also then with the intervention of legislation, um, often setting certain requirements or limitations or indeed maybe you know covering an, an area entirely as, as legislation does. So... Um, Moving from the idea of benefit, then the transferring the burden of the restrictive covenant. So you can see this idea of transferring. It's, of course, the benefit and the burden idea uh, is fine with respect to the individual parties that have entered into the agreement themselves. But the question then arises is, but, but what about those who take subsequently? What about successes in title? What about um, assinees where the the the, uh, the lot has been sold, or transferred, or assigned, as we say in law. Do they also uh, do they get the benefit, or do they do they carry the burden? So this idea of transferring the burden of the restrictive covenant, um, and as the, the notes indicate there on page ten, as with transferring the benefit of a restrictive covenant, transferring the burden 
of a restrictive covenant must be considered in view of um, the common law principles, equitable principles, etc. So those areas of, of legal definition and control, again, need to um, be uh, considered. And, and the, the point here is that the common law, of course, as it normally is, more, more stringent and more fixed uh, in its position and equity responds to that by being um, uh, more flexible in, in its uh, approach to the situation. Um, and um, certain things that, you know, the law, law wouldn't countenance um, in this area and uh, the idea of um, um, those restrictions being in place and... Uh, the, the, for example, in terms of the passing of the burden uh, on page 886 of ARPL, uh, unlike in the case of leaseholder states, the inflexible rule of common law is that the burden of a freehold covenant will not run to an assignee of the covenant or the covenant or covenant or the one you know giving giving the, the, the covenant the covenantee being the one in, in receipt of it, um, and. It was because of that inflexible approach, which the common law, as we know, generally know from all the studies, of course, is that's the position of common law, um, equity responded to that um, with um, a more flexible response. And as indicated on page 888 of ARPL 18.100, um, equity intervened with the through the famous decision of Tolkien Moxay in 1848, where basically the Lord Chancellor um, upheld a grant of an injunction restraining Moxay from uh, developing land. The decision was based on the fact that Moxay purchased the land with notice of the covenant. Um, and so basically this idea of allowing it to, um, the burden to pass was recognised. And so that's a working between from the more inflexible position of common law to what equity was prepared to countenance. And you can see uh, Tolkien Moxo is referred to there on page 10, as is the Forest View decision, which is an important um, uh, decision uh, in this area. And in terms of uh, the transferring the burden under restrictive covenant, basically you can see three points uh, needed there. So the covenant has to be negative in substance, so focusing on the substance rather than the form. Um, the negative, the restrictive covenant must relate to the land, the covenantee, and the original parties must have intended the restrictive covenant to run with the land. So that must be in, in, in the substance of the covenant that was originally um, negotiated and, and reduced mostly in, in, into writing between the parties. Um, all right, and there's a little bit of discussion there about, as I've already indicated, you know, the, the registration of covenants in Queensland um, and, and relate to certain types of covenants. Um, building schemes um, specifically discussed there on pages 11 to 12 and uh, in um, ARPL you can see those addressed under the um, heading schemes of development um, starting at page 901. You can have a look at, uh, at that discussion in terms of how that uh, works um, and operates for those particular types of um, situations. Uh, it's also possible to modify um, and, of course, to discharge restrictive covenants. This can be done by statute, um, Property Law Act, Section 181, um, or by agreement between the parties. Okay. So with those overview points and comments with respect to this area. Let's have a look at the tutorial problems. And <laughs> you probably, you know, I know, I know <laughs> some of you um, scratch your head sometimes at these questions that I <laughs> come up with, but they're, they're not, I mean, the questions are intended uh, to, to achieve a few outcomes, you know. And so I'm trying to always, you know this, you, you, um, most of you will know this by now because many of you have been studying with me for over a year. Um, I, wanted you, I want you, and I'm very important, to, to look under the surface of what's going on and to, to think about the underlying purpose and motivations 
to ask how the law is responding to what people are trying to achieve. How is it dealing with this area? Is it doing it adequately? And, and what, what's, what's being achieved through the legal framework? Um, you know, the Grey and Grey book, land, land, land law, gray, uh, the, the Grey and Grey land law book, um, it's an excellent text. And I haven't prescribed it in this course. Um, it's not, I mean, it's an English text, but it's a very thoughtful, reflective and expansive work that looks to the broader um, purposes and, and underlying ideas and motivations and, and, and values, if you like, and put it like that, within the framework of property law and land law that, that we have. So that is a quote from, this is problem 18, from Gray and Gray. Do you agree that positive covenants affecting freehold land bizarrely remain for the most part unenforceable against third parties? Well, what this is really tossing up is this idea that the, the um, uh, covenant is in a sense contractual and it's between the parties that entered into the covenant, the covenantor and covenantee. And the issue about subsequent successes in title to that land and assinees of, of the land, you know, those to whom the land's been transferred, um, whether they are equally affected by the covenant, that's where the issue arises. And when we start understanding that the covenant is understood in contractual terms, then, of course, that takes us back to the issue of privity of contract. Now, unlike the circumstances of the lease, where there is privity of estate, okay, and that's noted in ARPL, and you can have a look at that in a few early pages there of this topic and also in the earlier topic on leases, that doesn't apply to freehold covenants. They are contractual, right? So the question then is, um, how do they get applied uh, in relation to, and enforced, uh, in relation to third parties? And um, the response really is that there should really be no obstacle to the enforceability of these covenants. Um, and if there isn't any problem, say, for example, in the context of a lease, why should there be a problem in the context of um, freehold estate? All right? And the other point, too, is that um, given the fact that all land in Queensland um, is under the Torrens system and under the LTA, um, Purchases of land, purchases of lots can readily uh, discover uh, obligations in relation to the property that they're acquiring. So the issue here is about well, why shouldn't they be enforced? Right? But the, the purpose of the question is to get you to think about the nature of the covenant and, and how it can be enforced or not enforced subsequently and what mechanisms are available, either at law or in equity, and of course the intervention of legislation in a um, uh, specified way. But don't forget in that context, I'll just take you back to something that again, a uh, point that ARPL um, tees out, which I think is, is opposite at this point. Um, 18.20 on pages 882 to 3, um, the authors indicate that the law relating to the enforceability of freehold covenants has been criticised by one commentator as blundering conceptualist jungle, as a blundering conceptualist jungle full of semantic swamps. It's fairly strong language, isn't it? And elsewhere as a morass of technicalities, inconsistencies and uncertainties. Hardly, uh, it's hardly <laughs> plain sailing um, with um, um, you know, um, topsails uh, up, topsails up and <laughs> gathering full way. 
Several law reform proposals have been made, um, and reference there to um, the English the work of the English Law Commission, uh, recommending, interestingly, that the existing division between covenants enforceable at law and equity should be replaced by a new legal entity called a land obligation. That's really interesting, isn't it? So let's replace this complicated framework that's evolved over time with something new, something fresh, and we're going to call it a land obligation. Um, it's worth reflecting upon, I think, in terms of the value of, of that, generally, <clears throat> in this particular area, but also generally in terms of sometimes, you know, things do get overly complicated and overly attenuated in the law, and sometimes some clarity and some fresh start with a change of how we describe the rights and obligations between those that are in legal relationship can be useful. But having said that, Having said that, um, the, uh, the, the nature of this land obligation that the English Law Commission identified would be, in their view, automatically enforceable by and against the owners of the respective lands and the re uh, at the relevant date. However, as the authors ARPL note, no Australian jurisdiction has fundamentally reformed the law on the subject on this subject, and with some exceptions, the law is still based primarily on case law. Now, we've seen, just as I noted earlier in the, in the tute, um, then in Queensland, we've got those provisions, um, but it, they don't comprehensively deal with the picture. You know, that's, that's absolutely the case. You still need to look at that body of case law about the ideas that have emerged through the common law and through equity in terms of what is a freehold covenant, in terms of how do we enforce a freehold covenant, and in terms of the ideas of benefit and burden, and the extent of the, the extent to which these are are able to to carry through to, as I've been saying, um, successes in title to that lot or to um, assignees um, with respect to the lot, and. Um, it's important here to understand that the covenant, the freehold covenant, is not operating in the same way as, as, the, as an easement does, for example. So an easement um, attaches to the land and, and is an encumbrance on the land, as noted on the, on the indefeasible title. Well, the freehold covenant, apart from the exceptions, you know, the, the covenants involving statutory authorities under the LTA, they do not function like that. But the law has found mechanisms and ways to subsequently enforce them against successes in title and, and assinees because if they weren't able to do that, then the whole purpose of the freehold covenant with regard to restricting land use for particular purposes concerning amenity and, and other matters and so on would have been pointless, really. That's the truth. Because this needs to be a continuing uh, feature with regard to, to that area. And actually, if you go back to those, those illustrations again that I posted onto the Moodle site under this topic, that's, you know, there and you're right in front of your eyes uh, is an example of, of what's been able to be preserved and achieved by the law allowing the covenants to be able to be enforced going forward uh, to successes in title and, and s and um, from the original covenanting parties, covenant or covenantee. Um, so that's really what um, that first question <laughs> was trying to trying to tease out. Um, and then problem 19, what I'm really trying to get you to think about here is uh, is the this takes us back just the read to the question. Um, is there a difference between the indefeasibility of a covenant in reference to the mercantile case? And you're all, I know, <laughs> with the mercantile case after the quiz. All of you had some fun games with mercantile uh, and shell. And the extent of an interest noted but misdescribed, and that takes us back to the Bursal and Berger Brothers case, um, which we looked at you know, quite early in the course, actually um, right back in the Torrens title, uh, Torrens topics, fundamental aspects of torrents, but, um, you know, it was 
touching on some of these matters indirectly, um, which we didn't yet fully appreciate. But And the ambit of a restrictive covenant, which is necessarily dependent on matters of facts that are extraneous to the register. So, you know, the question is, and Bursal, of course, was about an easement, which also restricts use. Um, and uh, in mercantile, the recognition of the indefeasibility of the leasehold covenant, um, it, it restricts what can, you know, that the title to the extent of the indefeasibility protection for that covenant in that lease that's registered um, on the title, forms an encumbrance on the title. And how does that sort of sit with the restrictive covenant, which we're specifically looking at, of course, in the context of this topic, um, necessarily depend on matters of fact extraneous to the register. So where within the context of Torrens, the register is essentially considered everything, at least in theory, and the curtain principle, which you might recall from you know, when we first um, looked at that, back in um, top, even topic two, I think it was, um, when I laid out those three principles, the, the, the curtain principle, the mirror principle, and uh, the assurance principle. Um, that you, you know, in theory, the idea of torrents is you don't need to go behind the register. Looking at the certificate of title, or in Queensland, the indefeasible title, that's all you need to do. That's it. But as we've seen, the courts have, have not um, acquiesced to that. Um, Bursal and Burger Brothers is an example of that. Um, mercantile is another example where, of course, the lease is, is there, but you don't know what the terms of the lease until you actually go and examine the lease. Okay, so you need, you need to do that as well to see the terms and, and some of those covenants within the lease may, you know, as we've seen, attract the indefeasibility. And, of course, with freehold covenants, apart from those that are specifically recognised, as we've mentioned, under um, uh, Division 4AA of the LTA, they will not be there on the register. So, so what, what do we do? And, and, and it is attacking this idea that we can't go behind the register, but, but we have to. That's the truth. We have to look to these matters. And we can respond to this really by saying that, um, that each of these require different inquiries um, to be made, um, the former uh, doc, uh, the former look. You need to look at the documents of the register, whereas um, with the latter, um, both the register and the land need to be um, considered. Um, and uh, if we think about this in pragmatic terms or in a practical way, then uh, an examination of the land um, would be required in any event. And, and, and that's always something that should be encouraged as a matter of practicality, that a purchaser of land or someone acquiring an interest in it, go and have a look at the land. Don't just rely on documents. Don't just rely on uh, documentary information. But it's where the circumstances permit, go and have a view, in quotes, a view of the lot. Um, it's not always practically possible, of course, and when I say that, I don't just mean necessarily looking at an online image. That can not necessarily reflect reality to its greatest degree either. So that's also um, something that I think is important. Um, and um, really, this question is trying to get you to think about the balance to be struck here between the various mechanisms that exist for the protection of interests for the um, enforcement of obligations and rights and how the framework of legislation, um, general law and equity have found a way to, to work together to achieve a purpose of as best as possible to preserve the fundamental ideas of the torrent system in Queensland reflected through the LTA and how other rights and entitlements can also and should also be um, respected and, and uh, understood 
and how they can continue to bind and affect um, owners of the land in various ways um, and also those who acquire that land subsequently. And not all of that information will necessarily be on the Torrent Register and it will require investigation, it will require uh, thoughtful reflection and it may and very often uh, a person acquiring an interest is would be urged, encouraged as a matter of practicality to actually go and physically view the land in question. Um, so that's really what that question is, is getting you to do. And in the context of this topic, what it's really getting you to think about is the extent to which at the end of the day, we understand how freehold covenants fit within the, the framework that, that, ex, that provides the basis for explaining the rights and responsibilities of landowners and, and others with respect to part, lots and, and, and interests in land and where we need to go to find this information. And in Queensland, of course, where all, all property is, is Torrens land, we still cannot just rely on what manifests on the indefeasible title. Today, of course, in electronic form, um, and for some time in this state, um, things that affect the land we may need to we need to look elsewhere to to understand the full array of that now there's one further aspect to this just as we we draw to a close because i've been going away for about 50 minutes um as a as a legal practitioner going forward right, or lawyer you're not only going to have situations where you know you're going to be dealing with clients where they're looking at what's affecting the land or um, you know, what, what they need to be mindful of. You can certainly be in circumstances where you're going to be required to draft up instruments, legal instruments. Okay. And um, there's a difference between, for example, drafting up a property law instrument on the one hand and drafting up, for example, a clause in a contract. It's a difference between drafting a covenant and a lease to uh, drafting up um, something that is purely contractual and uh, preparing a freehold covenant, for instance, and the terms and the, the features of that. And even though, as we've said, it's contractual in nature, it ultimately has proprietary implications for both the covenantor and the covenantee in the first instance, and if you're depending on who you're acting for in that, you need to make sure that this is a you know a document, a, a, an instrument that that uh, can be enforced vis-a-vis -vis the parties, but that against the legal framework, it has the capability to to also be subsequently enforced, which is what would be intended um, in in uh, building schemes, housing developments. This is particularly the case. Um, but again, through the illustrations that I've provided in that document that I loaded onto the website, not just in, in that context, but in, even in a broader context. Okay. So um, just, just uh, to wrap up, um, basically what we needed to grasp in this topic is we need to understand the nature of a restrictive covenant. We need to understand the, the parties to a restrictive covenant. And we need to understand that restrictive covenants uh, can be transferred, they can be modified, and they can be discharged ultimately. And there is an impact here in the way this can happen, both from the perspective of common law, um, the intervention of equity, and the role that the, part of the legislation plays increasingly in the modern period. But it doesn't codify, so we still have this matrix of of, of law that we have to um, uh, respond to, and as I referred you to a bit earlier, the, the points made from ARPL, that um, you know there's a degree of 
criticism about the arrangements with freehold covenants, understandably so, and there's no comprehensive um, reworking of this area in any jurisdiction, including Queensland. So you just need to be mindful of that. And um, this is not necessarily an unimportant topic. So you need to be mindful of that too. Um, all right. I think that's probably enough uh, <laughs> covering the field, as it were. So um, I'm going to sign off now, and um, hopefully uh, we can get a few people to join us for Topic 11 this evening uh, at 8.30. Bye for now.